grand week I think we've had. Um, it, I think it's been encouraging for my soul. Hopefully it's been encouraging for your soul. Uh, same format tonight. We're going to have a quick prayer. And our praise team is going to come sing a couple songs and prepare our hearts to hear uh, from, from Philip Harrington. So I, I left my notes. That's what I was looking for. Somebody's got my sticky note with all the information on it. Right? But we'll, we'll give it a shot. Uh, Long-term pastor of First Baptist Church Live Oak. Uh, eight, 18 years. Man, see, I thought I was slipping. A graduate of Mercer University. A graduate of Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Um, and so... At, uh, serving there, and, and then he is now our North Florida Regional Catalyst for the Florida Baptist Convention. And if you remember tonight, our plan was uh, Tommy Green was going to be here with us. He had a cardiac event. If you pray for him tomorrow, is going he's going to have open heart surgery. And so, uh, but, but Philip's here tonight with his wife Christina and uh, two <coughs> wonderful kids. I got most of it, didn't? Yeah, awesome. See, extemporaneous speaking. <laughs> well, that's the highlight of the night for me. Listen, um, uh, just three quick things you need to know. Um, we will release information about John Edison's uh, funeral services as quick as we can, as we know. I was able to see Terry this afternoon. As I left, uh, he wanted to go for a, a ride, and they were getting ready to put him in Murray's truck and take him for a ride around the farm. And so, but be in prayer for them, and uh, they're, they're all there tonight, and um, they loaned us Glenn to come, he needed his desserts, so he showed up here with us, and then also, um, Brother Leo is back at Haven, and um, if you just have a few minutes to swap, stop by, he's in room one, first call right there, uh, he, he's, he seems to be in a, a pretty steady decline. And uh, so if you would just have a few minutes to stop by and visit with him and pray with him, um, he's probably in a condition, he's even struggling to remember some of the people in the room. Um, but his, his son told us he uh, delivered him there and, and, and he was there. So we went and made, went and made a quick visit with him. But uh, we want to be in, in prayer for those things and, and certainly in prayer uh, for Tommy. And so let's pray together. Father, we thank you. Thank you for these nights we've had together. A chance to hear the word of God. To hear it preached and to hear it uh, truthfully preached about important topics like anxiety. And to hear it last night about our work that you have for us. That you want us to be involved in, in the word and the sharing of the word and doing the work of an evangelist. And we believe tonight you have a word for us from your holy scripture. And Father, I would pray uh, that the words of of Philip's mouth would encourage us and challenge us and charge us. I thank you for those that are here. Lord, we pray for these uh, very certain situations. We pray for Tommy. Pray tomorrow that he would guide the hands of these surgeons that are going to care for him. I pray for everything that needs to be accomplished in his body to be accomplished. I pray for a um, speedy recovery. Lord, we continue to pray for the Edison family. We know that they have walked through this valley for quite a while. I pray for peace and grace and hope and certainty. I pray for the Tillises, a family that's so deeply loved in this community. And I pray for Terry. I pray for comfort. I pray for their Leo um, in these uncertain days that he's experiencing. One thing we can rejoice in, every person we've talked about, we believe that they have a relationship with you. And that um, when they close their eyes, they will inherit all the promises that you've ever given them in Scripture. And Father, we rejoice in that. And tonight, let us now turn our hearts and our minds and our attention to worshiping you tonight in spirit and truth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with us as we sing. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Jesus.
Chris, uh, my first uh, interactions with him were right after uh, Hurricane Adelia came through, and I was fresh on the road as a North Region Catalyst, nothing like taking you brand new in a position trying to learn everything, and all of a sudden you got a hurricane to deal with, right? And uh, so, but I got uh, information from him, and they were, you were as a church helping out to uh, minister to churches in the area, you were trying to specifically help some of your sister churches down on the coast, I believe it's Swanee or Horseshoe Beach, one of those, I forget which one, but uh, that was our first interaction. I just want to say thank you. Uh, what a blessing it was for me to be able to help communicate. Listen, there are churches that are coming alongside you who are hurting and helping. They are dealing with things themselves, but they're trying to help you as well. So I just want to say thank you, first and foremost, to your pastor and to you as a church for being faithful in that. And uh, we pray that uh, our region will have to see that again, and when those things do happen across our state, that we'll still respond in, in due fashion of being able to come alongside and help those churches. So just a word of thanks. So I, I talked to him about a lunch one day. We haven't been able to schedule that, but we're going to get it one day and uh, have lunch together and uh, just enjoy some time. I want to just learn more about how God's at work here and to be able to uh, serve with you. Now, I know what you're thinking right now, and I get that, and I completely understand it. Two years ago, uh, my son, I'll tell you, we have a son and a daughter. Uh, Chris, uh, Pastor Chris introduced, uh, mentioned uh, my wife, Christina, who's with me tonight. Our daughter is uh, will be 21 next Wednesday. I know I don't look a day over 30. I appreciate the compliments there. Thank you for that. And uh, she'll be 21 on Valentine's Day. She's a grad student at Valdosta State and uh, University up in Valdosta, Georgia, to be a speech-language pathologist. She's going to graduate in December, Lord willing. And therefore, she'll be off my payroll. And um, so I've got a list that she can pay me back. And, uh, and 
that's okay. Our son, Jack, is 16. He's a sophomore at Swanee High School. He plays basketball and football and weightlifting and track. And uh, we adopted Jack in 2012 from Haiti. And there's a longer story there. I can tell you another time. Uh, but uh, Jack was about this tall when we brought him home as a four-year-old, about to turn five. And he stands a little over 6'3 now. And so, uh, yes, indeed. Uh, I still remind him, though, who dad is, all right? He's I still remind him. I'm dad. And that's okay. But we have those two. And uh, we love them dearly. We still live in Live Oak. And that's home for us. I travel through the region every day um, seeking to just connect with pastors and churches. So, but I don't forget that two years ago, um, for a Christmas present, I got my son Jack, because he's a basketball guy, I got him tickets to an Orlando Magic game. He wanted to go watch a professional game. I said, we'll go to Orlando. And at the time, my, my daughter and her boyfriend wanted to go, so I got four tickets, and we hauled off to Orlando to go to the game. This is in 2022. And we got to the arena there, we parked, we paid the park, we walked down and got to the arena and we got inside and of course, you know, everybody wants to eat and that cost you $175, it seems like, to buy two pretzels and a drink or something like that. And, um, so uh, we were gonna we were gonna eat and um, we got into our seats and I wasn't paying for the, for the expensive seats, you need to understand. I mean, there, there were four of us that were going, I told you, my daughter's still on my payroll. But, my son's on my payroll, and so was the, at that time, the boyfriend. So, I mean, I went and we got some cheap seats, and we got up there, and they, they went to introduce the Orlando Magic. They introduced the visiting team that played the Miami Heat, and they introduced them, and some of the, their guys were out because of injury, and they introduced them, and they went to the starting lineup, and I didn't recognize a single name that night. Not a single one. Now, I'm not a big basketball fan, but I didn't know a thing or two, and I looked at my son, I looked at, at that time, my daughter's boyfriend, and and uh, he looked at me and just shook his head. So we did a really quick Google search. Turns out that on that day, they had called up three or four of their players from their minor league team out of Lakeland, Florida, because the rest of their guys were sick or injured. And I said, well, isn't that just a fine note? We spent all the money to buy the tickets, and we got to watch the subs coming home. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. And you didn't pay for tonight. You didn't get to, you know, I don't get any pay for that. But I'm just simply saying, you came for Dr. Green and you said, we got a sub. All right. <laughs> I understand. I get it. I get it. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. And uh, we're going to trust that the Lord Jesus is lifted up. I do want to say a word of thank you to you on behalf of Dr. Green and Ms. Carey. I thank you for praying for them. We have I've had our leadership team meeting this morning on Zoom, which we do about every week, and uh, he joined in on that Zoom for about three minutes this morning. Uh, he joked with us because he was in the hospital bed and had his hospital gown on, he said, this is the new Florida Baptist Convention swag we're going to give out. Again, <laughs> right? and, um, but you pray for them as he has that surgery. Their sons are with them there in Jacksonville. And I know that he would want to be here today. I know that he would want to be at home as well. So we pray for him and his leadership, and we pray for God to do a work in his life and their life in the midst of this. You know, not too many months ago, they lost their son, uh, one of their sons, and so it's been a rough time. So I'm going to invite you. Could you just call for me right now? Let's pray for them. I know we have already, but let's pray again. Lord, not that we pray too much or not that we can't pray again, but we just pause and say thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the ministry you give to us as Florida Baptists. And I thank you for the faithful churches of our Florida Baptist Convention. And I thank you for what they desire to do to reach their communities where you have placed them. I thank you for this church out front of this sanctuary, that, that marker that commemorates this church. Thank you for their desire to reach the men and women of this county and this city. Reach out from here to this state and to this nation and to the nations of the world with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the leadership that you've given to us as far as Baptists through your servant, Dr. Green. 
Lord, we thank you that he has navigated and helped the state navigate a, a transition for a number of years. And Lord, I thank you for his vision and ministry. And I thank you for the opportunity to serve together what it means to be right beside you. Lord, I thank you that as he has pressed that into the lives of those who work with him to be right beside pastors and churches and to encourage and to strengthen and to celebrate, I pray that he would, and Miss Karen as well, tonight and tomorrow and in the days to come, would know as well what they have sought to pour into Florida Baptist will be poured into them, that they would know their 2,700 plus churches, congregations who want to be right beside we pray this, the doctors who do surgery and the nurses attend, the anesthesiologists, all those who have been involved, Lord, we pray that the guiding hand of the great physician would be ever present. Give us great wisdom of how we continue to pray for them and pray with them and to serve for the sake of the gospel. We know that you know all things and you're in charge. So, Lord, our prayer, though, your will be done as he goes through this surgery, that he would be strengthened from it, that, Lord, he would um, be healed of that which has been causing the issues. Lord, he would, in due time, be back home as husband, father, grandfather, and he would be back in due time serving across the state, helping and encouraging churches, preaching, teaching, celebrating all that you've done. We give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to ask you to take a Bible tonight and turn to the Old Testament, if you would. I know that Pastor Chris Bontz preached from Philippians uh, the other Monday night, and I listened and watched that. I know that uh, Pastor Darren Gaddis preached from 2 Timothy uh, last night, watched that as well. I'm going to invite you to the Old Testament to the book of Proverbs, chapter number four. I'm going to read from the American Standard Bible in a few moments, but Proverbs chapter four, you can find that if you don't have a Bible, you have a smartphone or you have a tablet with you that you can get it, that's fine as well. Just make sure you, if you can, someone beside you doesn't have one, have something, you do, you want to share with them, that would be helpful as well. But we're going to read in just a moment from Proverbs chapter number four. I read a book a number of years ago by an author, a pastor from Portland, Oregon. His name is Stu Weber, and the book's entitled Infinite Impact. It's really about the timeline of your life and of my life. And in that book, uh, there's not anything that I would say is a absolutely profound that, that I hadn't seen or maybe thought about before. But the way in which uh, Pastor Weber wrote it was, uh, was a great read. And I'm reminded in, in that book that he wrote these things. That you and I have been appointed a time and a season to live, a, a timeline. And it is in that timeline that God intends not only for us to live and please Him, but we are to be an influence on those around us. And in the day and in the age in which you and I, in the timeline of our lives, now live corporately, our timelines overlap. I heard your pastor tonight talk about some timelines of those in your church those that you're going to gather around those families, you're going to reflect on life and you're going to celebrate life and you're going to grieve for those who grieve. But we've given you been given a timeline. And in that, you and I want to please the Lord. But we live in a day and age when we are inundated <coughs> with conversations, we are inundated with articles, we are inundated with um, the, the dealing in our own families. Pastor Chris touched on this. Of the struggle that we face with social and mental and emotional anguish. Barna Research was prepared to produce a work entitled The Connection, Connected Generation. They surveyed some 15,000 individuals from 25 countries speaking nine different languages. And here's what they found from that survey. <clears throat> that of the 18 to 35-year-old category, only one-third of those who were surveyed 
said, I often feel deeply cared for by someone else. Only one third. I got an almost 21 year old and I got a 16 year old. Two thirds of them said that they don't feel deeply cared for. When we just focus on the data from the United States of that 18 to 35 year old uh, population that were surveyed, 49% of those in that category, 49% said that they have anxiety over important decisions and they were afraid to fail. And almost 40% said they often feel sad or depressed. 35% they often said they often feel lonely and isolated. Think about it. We live in a crisis of our emotional and mental and social health. But I want you to know something else, church. We live in a crisis of our spiritual health. Now, I'm not demeaning the things that we struggle with. And I'm so grateful as I listened to uh, Pastor Chris speak the other night from Philippians. I'm so grateful for that. What a profound sermon. Here we find a father in the book of Proverbs speaking to his son. And he's going to use the analogy of physical life and physical health, emotional health, and he's using it to teach spiritual principles into his son's life. I'm going to ask you to hear from the father Solomon speaking to his son and hear instead the words of the heavenly father who has so inspired him to write these words for you and me. Proverbs chapter number 4. I want to begin in verse 20 and read through verse 27. Here's what the writer says. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and help to all your body. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for it from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth, and put devious speech far from you. Let your eyes look directly ahead, and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch your, the path of your feet, and all your way to be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Turn your foot from evil. I didn't play basketball in school, didn't play football, hadn't always been as big as I am now. I certainly wasn't this big in, in high school, all right? Just tell me. I was a runner. I ran track, ran cross country. As a matter of fact, my connection to Chiefland, Florida is right there on the track at Chiefland High School as a sophomore. It's the first time, first medal I ever won as a track athlete. In second place in the two mile run that evening in the track meet. I grew up running. I ran in college as well as a D1 athlete. I understand the strain that running can have on your body. And as a 49-year-old now, I'm entering that age that some of you have entered before that I've heard you talk about. And that is when you wake up in the morning, you sit on the side of the bed for a moment just to make sure everything is working like it's supposed to, right? Before you get out of bed. I'm finding that all those years of running have put strains on the body, on the muscles and on the bone structure. We train, but no matter how hard we train, the body can still face injury. My son came home today talking about his shin splints from running. I said, yep, been there, buddy. We can deal with that. No matter how hard we train, no matter how young we are, our body's still susceptible to injury. But healthy bodies are better equipped to deal with injuries that come their way. Listen, healthy spiritual lives are better able to deal with where we live and how we live in the world we live. And so as much as we are concerned about maybe our physical or emotional or mental or social health, which are all important, we need not neglect as the body of Christ, our spiritual health as well. I think this time of renewal is such a beautiful time for that. So I want to just ask us for a moment to consider what the father says to the child. And hear the words of our father speaking to us about our own health. Using the analogy of Life, our physical bodies to address our spiritual soul, our context. 
See, spiritually healthy people, when we listen to the Father here, we recognize that spiritually healthy means that I have healthy ears that are tuned to wise words. Have healthy ears that are tuned to wise words. Listen to what he says again in verse 20. My son, give attention to my words and incline your ear to my sayings. I studied business at Mercer. I lived with two roommates who were doctors. And so while they were busy putting together molecules and such, I was watching Sports Center or playing basketball or doing something else. The ear is an amazing thing. The way God has so designed the ear to take that which is a sound, and you and I, it's a wave, and we are able to then translate it into a, a sound. Just make just humor me for a moment. If you're an audiologist in here, an expert in that, then just humorous because I can look up a Google article like the rest of us, all right? The auditory system has three parts, an outer, middle, and an inner ear. And the outer and the middle ear ensure that the acoustical vibrations from the air are transmitted to the liquids in the inner ear. And once in the inner ear, those vibrations are then transduced into electrical impulses which travel along the auditory nerve to the brain. And the brain interprets those impulses as sounds and connected those sounds to other expressions and experiences to determine volume and type of sound. Isn't that amazing? That God has so designed us to be able to take that which is a, a wave going through the air that we cannot see. Yet it, in our ear, it is transduced into an impulse that goes through our brain. So what you're hearing in your ear tonight are waves coming out of my mouth. So the writer says, give attention. It's an imperative it means to, to give an ear, we might say. But he couples that with what it means to say, incline. Again, another command to the son, incline. It means to turn. To turn the son. To extend, to stretch out. So you and I kind of get the picture, right? It's like the dad saying to the son, pay attention to what I'm saying to you. Cup your ear and turn towards me so that you can clearly hear the words. That's why Paul wrote to the church in Rome and he said, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Uh, how many of you have raised teenagers or raising teenagers right now? Anybody here willing to admit that? <laughs> yeah. We call it the valley of the shadow of adolescence. <laughs> And if you've raised teenagers, you're raising teenagers, then you know fact is fact. And here's the fact. There's a difference between hearing and listening. Amen? Amen. Our spiritual health says we need to have ears that are healthy to the wisdom of the Father. There's a lot of sounds. There are a lot of waves that are coming through the air. And they find a home in the canals of your ear and my ear. And they get transduced into pulses and move along a nerve to our brain and we hear those. And some of those sounds are things that we don't need to hear, that we don't need to be listening to. Sunday night for the Grammy Awards, I don't watch the awards show, but I saw this on social media. I grew up in the 80s and uh, if you were to ask me, uh, hey Philip, what do you think was the greatest decade of rock and pop music? I'd tell you the 80s. But there was a fascinating thing that happened at the Grammys. I don't know if you saw it on social media, but there was a duet from a relatively new artist, Luke Combs, country guy, and a relatively older artist, Tracy Chapman. And back in the 80s, Tracy Chapman had a hit named Fast Car. It was a great little catchy tune, and everybody liked it. Chapman hadn't performed in front of a live audience in years. The story behind that is though, though Luke getting his start did a cover of that song. And that's where he really got his start. So what a phenomenal moment to take those two artists from two different generations and put them on that stage 
And when hundreds were in that room and millions watching maybe around the world, there was a sense of being mesmerized as they watched Tracy Chapman strum that tune that many of them maybe remember back from 30-something years ago and listen to that. But there are tunes that you and I know as well. If I were practiced up enough because I'm not a musician, I could walk over to that piano and just with the black keys, I could maybe ping out a little bit of a tune that you would know is also familiar. sudden you've got experiences and emotions and memories that are coming back to you. Not because of a word that was said, but because of the sound that was made. How much more in the life of the believer should the sounds of the word of the Father resonate and find a home in our ears. How much more that we would listen intently to the words of the Father, incline, give attention, our ear to what He says to us. Spiritually healthy means to have ears that are healthy by the wise words of the Father. Spiritually healthy, number two, means to have eyes that are fixed upon the right of teaching. Look well, at what he says in verse 21. After do not let them depart from your sight, or excuse me, after he says, incline your ear to my sayings, he says in verse 21, don't let them depart from your sight. If you go to verse 25, he speaks of it again. He says, let your eyes look directly ahead and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Just as the ear is amazing, so the eye is equally amazing. How God has made, made us to perceive images and to transfer them in the brain, and to catalog them as they are and to recall them is beyond my comprehension. There's a man whose story, his name was Michael May, and at the age of 45, he miraculously regained his sight. He was blinded at the age of three and lived for 42 years without sight. In 1999, he was given the possibility to see again with a, what then was a revolutionary cornea transplant. Prior to surgery, there were only about 40 cases of sight restored to patients who had been either born blind or who had been blind most of their lives. And most of those patients followed a very similar pattern. At first, they experienced a euphoria as light would, would come and rush into their repaired eyes. They would see color and motion immediately. Everything was new and exciting. It was like a miracle. But then frustration would easily and quickly set in. Learning to live with sight involved a huge learning curve. Most of those individuals still couldn't perceive height or they couldn't perceive distance or depth or three-dimensional shapes. They, they couldn't read facial expressions and they couldn't even detect gender. They couldn't distinguish important information from trivial. At times, those in newly sighted patients felt that they, they didn't belong to the world of those who could see and they didn't belong to the world of those who couldn't see. Family members who had expected immediate change were often crushed by the very slow transformation. But Michael May's case was different. When the doctors removed the bandages from his eyes, just like the other patients, he could perceive, he couldn't perceive space or height or distance or depth or three-dimensional shapes. The, the moon like, looked like a big blob to him. He couldn't read people's faces, but unlike the other patients, May didn't get discouraged. Instead, he approached his new world with an attitude of adventure and a childlike wonder. He knew that learning to see again would involve not just one operation, but a lifelong quest to learn, to grow, to take risks, 
to change. And as he left the hospital, he would pepper, he'd pepper his wife with questions. What is this? What is that? Is this a step? Is this a plant, a flower? Is this a painting? Let me feel it. He rode elevators over and over and over just for the pleasure of trying to find the hotel lobby after the ride. He played catch with his son, horribly missing the ball before he finally got the hang of it. He continued to struggle with his transition to the reality of sight. His world often looked like a huge abstract painting. High-speed events such as the passing of cars or bicycles became something very frightening to him. Things often looked very close, frighteningly close. Other patients had felt discouraged or even depressed by this long, slow transformation, but May told himself that this was part of the adventure, that the leap forward was not really a leap at all if everything felt safe. And as a result, every day and even every failure seemed like a new opportunity for May to learn and to grow and to change. Listen, friends. Without healthy eyes, sight is compromised, if not completely gone, and life can be frustrating. But with healthy eyes that are focused on the wrong thing, consequences can be devastating as well. When the writer here says, don't let it depart, the writer here says, don't let there be a deviation. Don't let there be a turning aside. Don't let there be a, a going away. From what? From the words of the Father given to you. In verse 25, he says, look directly ahead. It, he, he's speaking towards that which is opposite of where I'm looking. So if I'm looking directly ahead, that means I'm not trying to look in the peripheral vision. I'm not even trying to look behind me, but I'm trying to look directly ahead. I want my gaze Spiritually healthy means we have eyes that are focused upon the word of the Father given to us. I told you I have a 16 year old son. I've been a teenage boy. I know what that's like. And we finally, as parents, moved as a teenager into allowing him to have a way to communicate it wasn't really anything that we necessarily wanted to do we felt in some sense a compulsion to do that and if you haven't let your teenager have a phone that's neither here nor there just saying we did that but I will tell you one of the things that, that scares me immensely about that for him as a teenage boy are the things that he can find even with all the parameters that I put on his phone I read his text messages and he knows that. They come to my iPad. So I tell him, whatever you text your friend, whatever they text to you, you better tell them. My dad's going to see it. I can check his search history. We can put limits on things that he can do and he can't do, but I promise you, listen, the criminal mind never stops trying to figure out how to attack. And we live in a world, particularly in America right now, we live in a world where our young men, and listen, and our young ladies, but also all of us, male and female, are under the attack of Satan when it comes to the eyes. There's been research done. 32% of teenagers say viewing porn is usually or always wrong, but 56% of them would also say that not recycling plastic is wrong. Think about that. More of them say not recycling is wrong than saying looking at porn is wrong. <clears throat> Nearly three quarters of young adults, 71%, and half of teenagers, 50%, come across what they consider to be porn at least once a month, whether they are seeking it or not. And teenage boys to 25-year-old boys, 81% of them surveyed said they seek out porn and 67% said they do it monthly. On the young lady side, we used to think that that was just a, a boy problem, right? On the young lady side, teenage girls to 25-year-old girls, 
56% say they seek it out. 33% say they do it monthly. If eyes are fixated on that, then tell me where they're not fixated on this. If the eyes are fixated on the things of the world and the things of the flesh, then I can guarantee you that the eyes are not fixated on the things of God. I'm spiritually healthy. The father says to his son, let your eyes not deviate from what I'm saying. Let your eyes look directly. Let the opposite of your eyes be the words of the Father. Don't let them turn away. Oh, we need to be people. We need to be people who, like the writer of Hebrews says, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We ought to fix our eyes on the word that is before us. Number three. Spiritually healthy, not only has healthy ears and healthy eyes, but the Father says it has healthy feet walking in the right path. Healthy feet walking in the right path. Look at verse 26 again. He says, watch the path of your feet and all your ways will be established. Don't turn to the right or to the left. Turn your foot from evil. For about 15 years now, my family... And I have spent a couple of weeks in the summer camping in the mountains of North Georgia. Now, we like that. We love camping. Our kids love camping. And we enjoy that. It's a getaway for us. You say, why don't you go to the beach? Well, I mean, we can go to the beach at other times. But also, dermatologists tell my wife, you need to go to the mountains, not the beach, right? So we go to the mountains. I remember one of the first years we went, we were there in the mountains, my wife and and our daughter Emma, this was before we had Jack, we went on a hike of one of the trails around the campground there, and we walked it backwards accidentally. It took us a while to get back to where we wanted to be, but we walked it backwards. It broke out in a thunderstorm, so we were soaked when we got back, and I heard all kinds of things about how I was as a dad and a husband and so forth, right? I don't remember. Didn't keep records of it, but nevertheless. The next year we walked it the right way, but I forgot to pay attention to which trail markers we were supposed to be looking at. So a 45 minute hike turned into a two and a half hour hike going the right way. The third year I was welcome to hike on my own. <laughs> <laughs> Not long after that along comes Jack, and so Jack indulges and humors Dad and we go for a hike. By now, after 15 years, we pretty much know the trail. I remember those early years of walking those trails. My little girl was off in between Christina and I, and I would lead the way, and then her, and then Christina would bring up the rear. And I would always say something to Emma if we were going to cross a little stream, and I would say to her, Step on the rocks where I step. If we were going through a muddy place, I would say, Walk in the footprint where I step. If we were climbing up, I would tell her, you step here first or step there. If we were going down, I would do the same thing for she and for her mom, just so that they would not fall and they would have a safe place. I think part of that also is from my own upbringing. You see, I'm originally from, born in Cordell, Georgia. If you know anything about Cordell, it's the worst known capital of the world. Both my mom and my, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. <laughs> Cultural context, got nowhere yet. I'm sorry. That's <laughs> what it says on the sign. Just tell you. Go. Just the message. And I spent many summers in the watermelon fields with my papa. And I can remember as a nine-year-old boy in those watermelon fields, my papa. And I remember following him as he would walk that because what we would often do is he would walk. Uh, we would never, only one of those years did we ever sell him in the field. And I praise the Lord for that. I didn't even know how to praise the Lord probably at the time. But I was just like, thank you, Lord, because we saw the semi pull up and we didn't have to load it. But every other time we had to load it. But he'd walk through and he would cut them and belly them up and we would pick them up and toss them to the, to the pickup truck. But I remember walking behind him. And everywhere he would step, I would step. One, I didn't want to step on a melon under a vine. But two, I just 
kind of made a game out of it, I guess, as a little boy. I had one step where my papa stepped. And then in the evenings after Nanny would cook supper, and we would have supper, and Papa would always take an evening walk around the field. He had a trail he had really just marked out around the edge of the field, all the way around. And I'd walk with Papa on that trail. I'd walk beside him and we'd talk, but a lot of times I'd walk behind him. And I'd make it a game, and everywhere he'd step, I'd just step. He'd take them big old strides, and my little nine-year-old legs would have to stretch to make those I think there's something from Scripture that you and I need not miss. When the writer of Proverbs tells us here, watch the path of your feet and ways, your ways will be established and don't turn to the right or to the left. I think there's something you and I need not forget about our own spiritual health. That we give careful consideration. That's what watch means. Careful consideration of your path. Pay attention to the track that you're taking. By the way, the image of that is also of a rut. Now, I know where I'm at. And I know what four by four is for, right? I don't drive four by four, but how about this? I get some street cred. My wife drives a four by four. <laughs> I've never had a four by four in my life. How's that? We oftentimes think about ruts as being something bad. Particularly when we're talking about spiritual things, getting stuck in a rut. But have you ever thought about the good of a rut? There are times a rut's good. It keeps you from slipping off in the ditch. Sometimes a rut's good because it lets you know how to get through the mire and the muck. And the writer here says to his son, as a father, Pay attention to the rut in front of you. Pay attention into the rut in front of you. You see, that's why Paul, when he wrote to the churches of Galatia, he said to them, we walk by the Spirit. And when we walk by the Spirit, we don't carry out the desires of the flesh. That's why he says to the church at Ephesus, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as the wise. That's why he wrote to the church of Rome, and he said to you and to me, as he said to that church, we walk according not to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The rut of our lives is that we walk in the path that the Lord is laying out for us. We follow, based on his word, the path, the rut that he gives to us. Why? Because it keeps us from the ditch. It keeps us from the ravine. It keeps us from going off the side of the mountain. So I look at my spiritual health and I have to ask the question, Lord, how am I doing watching the path of my feet? How am I doing looking at the rut? Because there's a whole lot of people that have walked around me and with me, and I don't want to follow in that way. I want to walk in your narrow way. As a young pastor, I had a mentor, an older gentleman who was a pastor as a mentor, and we would do a pastor's conference, and he would do that. There'd be only about 10 or 12 of us who were there. And he would say to us, listen, I, I'm not trying to suggest that I have done it all, I know it all, and I, I'm, I'm, I know everything, but I, here's what I'm telling you. Just look at me as someone who has walked in ministry ahead of you guys, and I'm down the rut, and I'm hollering back at you, telling you which way to go. Boy, could we so look at our own spiritual lives? Could we so look at our health that we would be able to look behind us, and it would be okay if our little daughter was following us spiritually? Not because we're anything great, but because we've so paid attention to the rut of our lives that we'd be okay with our son walking in our footsteps. Matter of fact, we would want that. That would hurt him. Let me move quickly. I know our time is drawing close. Number four, healthy tongues that abhor evil. Healthy tongues. Verse 24. Look quickly at verse 24. He says, put away from you a deceitful mouth and put devious speech far from you. You may call them trash can words in your home, not just those vulgar words, but just words that you said are not going to happen in our home. We're not going to talk that way in our home. We're not going to use that language in our home. The writer here says, put away. It's an imperative. It simply means 
Depart. But let what depart from your mouth? Let that which is deceitful or devious, that is, that which is perverse, that which is corrupt, let it depart. In the book of Titus, it says that we aren't to malign anyone. It says we are to avoid foolish controversies and strife and disputes. Avoid those foolish arguments. When Paul wrote to the, to the, the church in Rome, in the book of Romans in chapter 16, he encouraged the church, exhorted them. He said, listen, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you've learned. Hey, listen, because these men, they're slaves, not to the Lord Jesus, but they're slaves to their own appetites. By their smooth and flattering talking, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. No, the Father says here to His Son, their way, let depart from your mouth that which is devious, that which is deceitful, that which is perverse, that which is coarse. All of us have been guilty of that. But would it be that we were known by the words of our mouth that lead others to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus than lead others to know who we like or dislike in the political arena? Would it be more that we were so concerned about, may the words of my mouth be pleasing to you today, my rock and my redeemer? Would we be such that what we would say on Sunday morning as we would sing as a congregation together be no different than what we would say on Monday through Saturday, whether we were sitting at Barbecue Bills or at the Chiefland football game or wherever else you might be? Oh, that we would gauge our spiritual health and say, Lord, where are the words of my mouth deviating? Where do they need to depart from the coarseness, from that which is perverse, from that which doesn't need to be there? Lastly, the healthy life, the spiritual health to, has as number five, a healthy heart guarded by sound doctrine. It says in verse 21 about the sayings of the of the Father, don't let them depart from your sight. And he says at the end of that verse, keep them in the midst of your heart. He says in verse 23, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. A healthy heart. Healthy ears, healthy eyes, healthy thumbs, healthy feet, healthy hearts. Keep them in the middle. Keep them on the inside, he says. Keep the word of the Father on the inside of your heart. Watch it, he says. That is, guard it. We've heard that away, or we've heard that already. Watch that which is on the inside of you. That's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, when he spoke to the religious leaders, you're a brood of vipers. Oh, he says, you're a brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of what, that which fills the heart. In other places, we've seen Jesus say, it's not what goes in a man that makes him unclean, but that which comes out of a man, because that which comes out of this man, comes out of his mouth, comes from his heart. Jude exhorts those believers that they would contend for the faith. Oh, that they would contend for that which had been handed down to them, that which was the, the faith of the apostles that had been handed to them, that they would guard their lives, guard that teaching, so their lives would be guarded by that doctrine. Spiritually healthy, have hearts that hold the wellspring of life. And at the core of the heart is the word of the Father. The word little w, but the word big w, the Lord Jesus. I was at a Promise Keepers in Atlanta, Georgia one year, several, several years ago. I had to be in college, so mid-90s. John Maxwell, leadership guru, speaker. All the young boys that were in that thousands and thousands at that dome in Atlanta. They took all the young teenage boys 
out of that into a separate part and left in that arena were just thousands and thousands of young adult and dads, men, some without sons, some with. I don't remember what Maxwell thought about. I'll be honest with you, I don't remember that. But I remember this. I remember that at the end of that, he said this. Men, your sons are in the other room. They don't know what's going on in here. They don't know what we've been talking about. They don't know what, we, what I've been preaching about. But in, in a few moments, they're going to open those doors. And, and your sons are going to come through those doors. Now, here's what your sons have been told. Your sons have been told that when those doors open, you run as fast as you can. And they're at the back of the arena. You run as fast as you can that hundred yards or so to the other end of the arena and gather in front of the stage. That's all they need to do. He said, but here's what I want you to do. When I count to three, those doors are going to open. And when those doors open, I want you men, you dads, you grandfathers, the men of the church, I want you to stand to your feet. And as loud as you can, I want you to call those men, those boys that you know by name. I want you just to holler their name over and over. If you don't know any of those, I just want you to cheer. And I want you to clap. And I want you to applaud for those, those boys who are running. They don't have any idea what they're about to face. They just know they're going to come running in. And he said, when I count to three, you do that. And when he counted to three, those doors open. And those thousands of boys, teenage boys, come running. Thousands of them down that aisle towards the front of that stage. And when they did, those men, those dads, those men who were seeking out healthy hearts and healthy ears and healthy eyes and healthy feet stood to their feet and with loud applause and calling the name, some of them of their own sons, cheered on those men, those young men coming behind them to stand strong. Oh, oh could we be a church? Could we be a people? Could you be a church, and will you be a church here in Chiefland, Florida, who would so have the healthy eyes and ears and the healthy tongue and the healthy feet and the healthy heart such that you are cheering for those around you and the generation coming behind you. I heard their feet out here. And you would cheer for them to heed and to hear the words of the Father. You would cheer for them. Be spiritually healthy. It's got to begin with you, though. Don't miss this. It begins with you and me because it began with our Savior, who, with his own ears, heard the cry of the sinner's life, who, with his own eyes, saw the despair of a broken world. Who with his own sandal feet walked among us as sinners yet without sin. Who with his own tongue spoke not error but only truth to do the Father's will. Who with his own heart went to a cross to pay a price that you and I with sinful and broken ears and sinful and broken eyes and sinful and broken mouths and sinful and broken feet and sinful and broken hearts could not pay. He went to a cross that you and I could be healthy and whole. That you and I could be saved. That you and I could know that we have one who's gone before us and we follow him. Would you pray with me tonight? I know our time is up. And I know that there's a closing song, and I know some of you are eager to go, but I'm going to ask you just to be careful here for a moment. Would you be careful?
not to rush too much into what's next for you on tonight's calendar without hearing what the Spirit of God is saying to you. I don't know what you might need to do in response to the Lord speaking to you tonight. Your pastor's here if you need him. But I suspect in this congregation gathered here tonight, there's some ears and some eyes and some tongues and some feet and some hearts that God's been dealing with. It's not about behavior modification. It's about listening, seeing. It's about the word of the Father and to his child. Maybe you just need to come and get before the Father this morning, this evening. Maybe that which you have been looking at, that which you've been listening to, that which you've been saying, where you've been going, you just need to get before the Father and say, I repent. I'm sorry. Maybe you're here tonight and you've never given your heart to Jesus. You've got to begin there. Come to the Savior who went to the cross for you. You don't know what to do and how to do that? Your Pastor Chris is here. He's going to love to tell you that. Whatever it is. Don't leave this place tonight without being obedient. Not to me, but to the Father. Be willing to lay that down. Whatever it is in your life, surrender. Surrender your eyes, surrender your ears, surrender your tongue, surrender your feet, surrender your heart. We'll be spiritually helpful for a world that is lost and needs Jesus. We're going to give you, Father, the thanks for what you are doing in our lives. Thank you for the blessing of being able to serve you. Thank you for dying on the cross, being raised from the tomb. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The word that we listen to, that we look at, the word that we speak, the word that guides our path, the word that we've hidden in our heart, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.